Welcome to New England. For nearly 400 years, it's been home to some of the most significant events in the shaping of America. The arrival of the Pilgrims, the Salem Witch Trials, and the War of Independence, to name just a few. Some say this remarkable history has set the stage for extraordinary hauntings, ghostly visitations from another realm, a mournful woman who wanders the grounds of a Connecticut homestead, searching for her dearly departed lover. A mysterious young child who continues to play in the home he once loved. An elderly woman who refuses to vacate her former residence. This is the story of the ghosts who haunt the ancient dwellings of old New England. Specters from the past who have returned from beyond the grave. New England's first settlers came to the New World not in search of land or material wealth, but religious freedom. The Pilgrims arrived first, and within a decade of their landing at Plymouth in 1620, the Great Puritan Migration began. Between 1629 and 1642, more than 15,000 men, women and children sailed for the New World. Many of them settled in New England. These people were not only religious, but highly industrious. They built dozens of communities and lived off the land. Their strict code of behavior governed by the church. But along with their wishes for a better life, they brought superstitions from the old world. Among them, a profound fear of witches, warlocks, and things that go bump in the night. These elements have left behind psychic scars that can be felt by anyone visiting the area. A sense of history is most manifest in the New England area, and this history isn't always a pleasant one. And these tragedies, in fact, are the building blocks of haunted houses and reports of ghosts. The ghosts of New England's past have been making themselves known for centuries. Anyone fortunate or misfortunate enough to experience these hauntings will not soon forget what they have seen, heard, or felt. This is not a dead house. This is not an empty house. This is a house that's alive. Here we have resident spirits, and uh, they have a say, basically, in the house. I had gone to Jemima's grave and as I was doing that, an incredible sadness came over me. There was an actual physical heaviness that I felt. It was the weight of sorrow. And I had the most unbelievable urge to pick my head up and look through the doorway. And I kept fighting with myself for a few moments. Look, don't look, look, you have to look. And I was very, very afraid, but I forced myself to do it. And as I did, something had been there looking at me. And I wanted to flee out the front door, get in my car, and speed out of here. More than memories haunt these walls in the New England hamlet of Tolland, Connecticut. Those who visit what some call the state's most occupied, unoccupied building have come away reporting sights and sounds that cannot easily be explained. And if most hauntings are born from untimely death or unrequited love, the spirits inhabiting the Daniel Benton homestead have seen all of these and more, and don't keep their feelings to themselves. Gail White has been the director of the homestead, now run as a museum, for eight years. There are times when I do walk in the house, and uh, I feel that I'm intruding. That's about the best way to describe it. And I don't have to come very far into the house uh, just to get that sense that this is not a good time to be here. In fact, visitors often report feeling sadness and oppression rather than fear emanating from these walls. These feelings can be traced to the sorrowful history of two young lovers, Elijah Benton and Jemima Barrows. 
was 1775 and a young America was fighting for its very life. The call to arms had gone out and was heard in the small farming community of Tolland. Two lovers facing a very uncertain future must say goodbye as Elisha Benton prepares along with his brothers to go off to war. But it seemed things had never been easy for the couple. Elijah is Daniel Benton's grandson. Daniel was the builder of the house. And the family didn't approve of the match at all, didn't approve of the relationship. More than likely, that's because they were from two different stations in life. Jemima is a cabinet maker's daughter. And uh, in the 18th century, you didn't really mix outside your class. Nevertheless, Elijah, age 28, had already declared his love for 16-year-old Jemima. Before leaving, he vows a last promise to return no matter what and on his return to marry it is a promise that will echo through time Elijah went off to a war with his brothers to answer the Lexington alarm in 1775 and uh, they were all three of them captured during one of the battles in 76 um, put on prison ships in Long Island Sound prison ships in uh, the Revolutionary War were comparable to the German concentration camps they housed hundreds of men in absolutely horrendous conditions. No sanitation. They were overcrowded. Very little food. There was disease rampant everywhere. Men died on a daily basis. In fact, one day the news arrives to Grandfather Benton. Elijah's brothers have died of smallpox on such a ship. But of Elijah himself, there is no news. Grandfather Benton will die a few months later without ever learning the fate of his favorite grandson. As the weeks turn to months, there is still no word. Then one cold January day comes news. Elisha is alive, barely, 20 miles away, stricken with smallpox on the same prison ship where his brothers had died. It is the best and worst news the family can possibly get. Here's one son who has survived. But that's followed quickly by absolute panic and terror because smallpox is a deadly disease. There is, uh, it was a very high mortality rate. The disease itself was devastating in terms of what it, how it ravaged your body. When they saw him, when he came through the door and they set eyes on him for the first time, that they were devastated by the degree, the advancement of the disease. And to see him in that condition and to look at him and probably know that he was not going to survive would have struck him to the very core. The news of Elisha's return spreads quickly. Jemima rushes to the home to see him, not knowing what she will find. The house itself would have been under quarantine, so the parents' first reaction would be just to tell her no, she couldn't come in, she wouldn't be allowed in. But Jemima will not be denied. What she finds inside is overwhelming. Yet knowing the deadly consequences, she asks to care for him. In doing so, she has freed them from making the deadly choice while sealing her own yet knowing the deadly consequences she asks to care for him in doing so she has freed them from making the deadly choice while sealing her own fate at that time smallpox was claiming four out of ten victims but the chances were close enough to 50 50 that she really was taking a chance with her own life I think she was unique she was willing to leave her house uh, to leave the security of her own parents' home, to come into a situation where perhaps she wasn't really wanted, and to say, I'm going to um, take care of this young man no matter what, knowing that perhaps she would die from the smallpox. Sealed off from the rest of the house with food and water left by the door, Jemima does what little she can do to comfort her only love. More than likely, her, her, her role was to comfort and to, to try and deal with him in the few lucid moments that he may have had, to let him know that he wasn't alone. Jemima's parents, wondering why their daughter has not returned home, arrive and are stunned by what they see. Terrified of infection, they say goodbye and promise to return with clothes, but they never do. To them, their daughter is already dead. Then, a few short weeks later, Elisha Benton is gone, having kept his promise to return, no matter what. 
It is January 21st, 1777. With Elisha gone and knowing the pain that she too will endure, all Jemima can do is wait. Thanking God for Elisha's final release from pain, she begins to pray for her own and of the time she can rejoin her love. She probably didn't come down with the disease right away. She was infected with it more than likely in his last days. While Jemima was sick, she would have been put into the kitchen bedroom again for care. Probably not the same kind of care that she gave Elijah. In the end, Jemima's death was a lonely one. For where Elisha had her, she had no one. On February 28th, less than a month after Elisha Benton died, so too did Jemima Barrows. But not even in death would her dreams be realized. They buried them against the stone walls, and they're separated by about 40 feet. Um, it would have been proper to bury them side by side. They weren't married. And uh, people say that uh, the spirit of Jemima is still present in this house, on these grounds, searching for Elijah. I didn't know very much about the house except for some skeletal history, some of the occupants, and I, I was told of the legends of Jemima Barrows and uh, Elisha Benton, but there were no real details that I was given about events or uh, eerie happenings in the homestead, so I, I really had nothing to go on. In 1989, Stephanie Speziali was given an unusual college writing assignment. Spend the night in the Benton homestead and report what took place. She asked a friend to join her. There were a lot of events in the house that took place that had happened repeatedly. All of those events were very unnerving. We heard voices, conversations going on, definitely of men coming from the basement. I did check the basement. There wasn't anything there. Stephanie wondered what she would find on the second floor. I went up the stairs a little bit after the time I actually arrived here. We had not, in the original tour of the house earlier that day, explored upstairs. And I uh, went all the way down to the end of the hall where the last room was and opened the door and stepped in. It became very, very cold, and there was a definite pressure change that I could sense all over my body from head to toe. And uh, I started to feel as though I was suffocating. And I had never experienced that kind of a sensation before. So I stepped out of the room, and I shut the door, and immediately returned downstairs. I felt very unnerved by the experience. Uh, it was very unfamiliar to me. And I felt as though there may be something else there except for me. As the evening progressed, Stephanie encountered even more ghostly occurrences. Toward about 4 o'clock, I think, or so in the morning, my friend Tanya and I were sitting uh, at the sitting room table. But we started to play games. We were playing hangman on paper napkins and things like that, and I had the most unbelievable urge to pick my head up and look through the doorway to the uh, actual room where Elijah Benton had passed away. And I was very, very afraid, but I forced myself to do it. And as I did, something had been there looking at me. So I bolted from the chair with the flashlight to basically find it. And uh, unfortunately, it disappeared before me, and I never got a chance uh, to really uh, encounter exactly what I was hoping for, I guess. Sometimes the spirits are less shy. Several years ago, before the homestead was turned into a museum, the owner rented it out to a local couple. The couple were sleeping in the front bedroom, and the woman woke up to see a man standing at the foot of the bed. And her immediate thought was that it's her husband. And uh, the next thing is that uh, the woman felt a hand over her mouth and she reached push it away and it then it just evaporated and she looked over and her husband was sound asleep in the bed beside her so it wasn't him and uh, that was a very unnerving experience to the best of my knowledge these are fairly reliable people and it's generally accepted that that they experienced something unusual i truly believe that the people living here were very connected to each other and very connected to this place. Whatever entities they are now, uh, their love and their attachment to these things and places and to each other is beyond boundaries. 
Well, to anyone coming in and, and totally denying the existence of spirits, that's their own opinion. Uh, what we do is tell a story. This is a house that's alive. It's still a living, breathing house, and I think it, it breathes and lives through the spirit of Jemima, Elijah, and people down through the centuries who have um, lived also with great sacrifice and love in their lives. Um, I think it still carries through today. You can feel it. There's sadness at times you can feel. There's strength as well. Two hours north of the Benton homestead, another haunting can be traced to one of the most disturbing chapters in New England's long history, the Salem Witch Trials. We now return to Haunted History. An hour's drive from Boston sits the seaside community of Salem, Massachusetts thought by many to be the most haunted place in America. The city was founded by English-born Roger Conant in 1626 when he arrived from Plymouth, Massachusetts with a group of settlers. In 1692, Salem became forever associated with witch hysteria. Two young girls aged 9 and 11 began having what witnesses described as blasphemous screaming, convulsive seizures, and trance-like states. A doctor, unable to determine any visible cause of their behavior, attributed the symptoms to witchcraft, a crime which in 17th century New England was punishable by death. The girls accused several local residents of causing their fits through witchcraft. Fear and suspicion spread like wildfire throughout the community. Before long, 141 people were arrested. The trials that followed are among the most famous and notorious in American history. The first to be tried was Bridget Bishop, who was found guilty and hanged on June the 10th. The trials continued throughout the summer, hanged on June the 10th. The trials continued throughout the summer, a parade of witnesses leveling a battery of charges against people from all walks of life. Finally, in October, the governor of Massachusetts stepped in and disbanded the court. But the damage was done. Five men and 14 women had been hanged and one man pressed to death. But to this day, no one knows the true cause of the young girl's bizarre behavior. There could be many explanations, but I think the root may be found in the Calvinist uh, view of religion, in which the devil plays such an important part. The Calvinists believed the devil was everywhere. He was a very real personality and always out to make life for Christians uh, difficult and try in every way to ensnare them into witchcraft or into acts of sin. One of the locations that figured prominently in the witch trials is now called the Joshua Ward House. In the early 1700s, the house sat across the street from the downtown docks. Author Bob Cahill is a former sheriff of Essex County, which includes Salem. He's now a historian and folklore researcher. This house is built on the uh, foundation of the old sheriff's house. Now, by the old sheriff, I mean the witch-hanging sheriff in 1692. Very cruel man, a nephew of the witch-hanging judge, Jonathan Corwin. George Corwin's house was here, and uh, rumor is, there's no evidence uh, that's been dug out thus far anyway, uh, that he would bring people back to this house or to this, this area and uh, would torture them here. We're in the cellar of the Joshua Ward house uh, in Salem, and this is actually where uh, George Corwin, the old sheriff of Essex County during which times, was buried for quite a period of time by the family, uh, mainly because they didn't want his body dug up by the citizens of Salem back in 1692, who were very, very 
afraid that the citizens would uh, tear them apart, which they probably would have done. This could very well be the area where uh, uh, George Corwin brought some of the victims uh, of the witch, uh, witch trials uh, to get information from them. Sheriff Corwin's cruelty was legendary. Some say he used his authority as sheriff to seize the assets of those convicted of practicing witchcraft. One particularly stubborn man accused of witchcraft was Giles Corey, a wealthy Salem resident. The law of the day allowed for the confiscation of property by the government from those confessing to witchcraft. Sheriff Corwin used an obscure English law to try and extract a plea, and perhaps property, from Corey. It's the old English law that if somebody didn't plead guilty or innocent, uh, you would crush him until a plea was forthcoming. And Corey never did give a plea, and he was crushed to death. Uh, but in the process, uh, Corey spit out a curse to the sheriff that I curse you and I curse Salem. Many believe that ghosts are linked to a last thought. If they wanted to do something just at the moment when they were dying, their spirit will attempt to complete that task. So a curse given at that moment, that moment of transition, would be especially powerful, and it would continue on longer than a curse given perhaps at another time. Less than five years after Corey's brutal death, Sheriff Corwin died of mysterious causes, a death perhaps attributed to his victim's curse. Today, some 300 years later, Bob Cahill uses his investigative skills from his days as sheriff to explore the bizarre and unexplained. Maybe I'm, I'm a complete history nut, but I, I think for the most part is, what is the history? Who is this person haunting this house? Why are they here? Uh, why are they hanging around if that's the case? It's as you research and you find these little tidbits of evidence, that's the thrill to me. Um, I'm like any average person. I mean, if, if a ghost appears or there's, it gets too spooky, I get scared. I mean, I'm, I'm no, no great courageous uh, ghostbuster. Perhaps because of its notorious history, the Joshua Ward House is one of Salem's most haunted locales, an unholy bastion of ghostly activity for centuries. We now return to Haunted History. In the late 1600s, the Joshua Ward House was reportedly the site of some of the most horrifying events surrounding the Salem Witch Trials. A recent occupant claimed she had many first-hand encounters with spirits that have remained behind. Uh, we purchased the home, the Joshua Ward House, like in the early 1970s for our corporate offices. It was a really wonderful time to be able to pick up such a historic site, and we were very fortunate. Or so she thought. Julie Taché soon discovered that something about her new office was not as advertised. Something that always happened when doors were locked and no one was around. Over here is a beautiful antique fireplace that they've restored and these lovely candle holders were upside down. And the candles that are there were not there, they were on the floor and they had been turned into squiggly S's and a short L. So I could not figure out how they melted in the middle of the night. And I have to assume that being one of the first people to come in in the morning and the last to leave at night, that there was no one in here who was trying to make me think I was in fantasy land. This startling image lends credence to Julie's sighting. It was taken in 1993 with a Polaroid camera and shows what appears to be a ghostly spirit. All of Julie's employees were having their picture taken. Only this one, taken just inside the front door, revealed the image of a haunting figure. 
Julie says the ghost also enjoys playing practical jokes. On several occasions, the ghost has apparently set off the house alarm, but only when Julie's partner was in town. I think she was a young prankster. Uh, I don't know, maybe 14 to 17, that's how I, I picture her. Because whatever she did was not mean or ugly. It was like a 14 or 12 year old playing tricks on someone who had a major crush on my partner. But the mayhem and chicanery does not end there. Julie's office was the site of more than just melting candles and unexplained alarms. If the door was locked, the lampshade once was turned, taken off the lamp and the lamp was turned upside down. Um, my trash basket was turned over. Um, it was always cold in the corner of the office where my desk was placed and I tried to adjust my mind to think that was because the heat was blowing in a different direction but uh, even when the fireplace was on that was a cold corner in the office. Another bizarre incident in the Joshua Ward house involved John, the cleaning person. One night while working alone he says an unexpected co-worker offered him a helping hand. He told me that he was uh, here vacuuming these stairs, and uh, all of a sudden he was crouched down on the stairs. He was crouched down on the stairs, and he felt this great pressure on his neck. And he thought somebody was behind him, that one of the girls had stayed behind and was holding him down. But when he turned around to look up to see who it was that was holding him down, there was no one there. He said, Mrs. Tache, I can't believe it. I had a cold hand put on me, and I thought it was my friend picking me up, and it wasn't. He said, so I left kind of early. I didn't think there were really ghosts. But when I got here, suddenly I had a little more respect for people who were seeing ghosts. And it seems rather prevalent in this area, in many of the houses, uh, because it goes back into history so much and as you talk about the Joshua Ward suddenly you hear yes there's a captain who's in my house with one arm and you're like oh my lord this is not real but it is real Barbara Cahill would certainly attest to that one day she paid a visit to Julie's office in search of an apartment she soon discovered she was not alone So I was sitting really in the front entrance of the home and I was looking into the living room and there was a chair by the fireplace and I looked over and I saw this figure of a very elderly woman. She was haunting. She didn't move. She just sat very still. She wasn't a, a live human being but she was uh, certainly something that was a part of something. The Joshua Ward house isn't the only haunted house in Salem. Less than a mile away, a home glorified by one of America's great novelists is said to be swarming with supernatural beings. We now return to haunted history. In the long history of the supernatural in New England, one man stands at the center of the swirl of ghostly activity. Salem-born novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne, author of The Scarlet Letter, has not one, but two haunted houses associated with him. The house in which he was born, and the House of the Seven Gables. Hawthorne was a direct descendant of Justice John Hawthorne, one of the original judges who presided over the Salem witch trials. Nathaniel added a W to his name to perhaps distance himself from his notorious ancestor. Still, he could never fully remove himself from his family's tainted past. Of course, sin and guilt pervade a lot of his stories. Um, he wants to cleanse his soul or purge himself of his background. He's descended from one of the witch judges. And this is what he does. This is how he does it, by, by writing these stories. 
As a young man, Hawthorne spent much time in the House of the Seven Gables, which was owned by his relatives, the Ingersolls. Nathaniel was especially close to his second cousin, Susanna Ingersoll. Susanna lived in the House of the Seven Gables for most of her life. She never married, and in fact died in the house at the ripe old age of 72. Many believe she's never left. The last few years, Susanna herself has been seen upstairs in the Phoebe room. She stood there once with a, a turban a few years ago and a shawl around her neck, like a woman from the War of 1812 era, and sort of frightened the morning tour in the house. Because they saw her standing by the window with the sea behind her, and uh, it was scary when you come in a room and you see this woman who obviously isn't alive standing there in front of you, and the, the tour guide, I guess, was a little shook up, too. Susanna was a wealthy woman with strong political beliefs. Some say she sympathized with the plight of the slaves in the South. In fact, she may have offered the House of the Seven Gables as a stop along the way to freedom via the Underground Railroad. It was, in truth, neither underground nor a railroad, but a system of hiding places for fugitive slaves. At its height, the Underground Railroad stretched from New England to Kansas and helped more than 50,000 slaves escape to the north. The House of the Seven Gables, with its multitude of nooks and crannies, would have been a perfect hiding place along the Underground Railroad. Some believe the spirits of runaway slaves and their benefactor, Susanna Ingersoll, live on in this massive colonial home. Many times people who are attached to a house, like Susanna, their ghosts seem to come back again and again. It's as if they have an emotional attachment to the actual structure. Perhaps it, it was because they felt more at peace in that one location than any other. Others believe the ghost of Susanna Ingersoll isn't the only spirit haunting the House of the Seven Gables. Tourists have reported seeing other spirits as well. We're in the attic of the House of the Seven Gables. Some years ago, probably at the end of the 80s, some people reported a little boy here on the side playing with his toys. He was from the Victorian period, dressed in a blue velvet suit. Now, I'm not sure which family he came from. He was really not paying attention to whoever was looking at him. He was just someone having fun, but he was not alive. He was not a person from our day. He was from an earlier period of time. Another house with even closer ties to Nathaniel Hawthorne has been the site of strange, unexplained apparitions. This is where Hawthorne was born in 1804 on July 4th, the American holiday. And um, he was born upstairs right in that room. Nathaniel Hawthorne's father was a sea captain who died when his son was just four. Nathaniel, his mother, and sister then left the house, never to return. But some visitors say their spirits, and the spirits of others who have lived in the house, have apparently stayed on. On tours in various rooms in the house, some people have reported little objects being moved around. Sometimes a chair is out of place. The old clock across the hall works by itself. It doesn't usually work at all. You see a little pendulum going back and forth. Who's setting that? I don't know, but probably one of the ghosts. My favorite ghost is Hannah Becker. She's the one who was a dressmaker. Allegedly, she's been seen sewing in this room up here, and uh, she's been flitting around upstairs, going from the children's room across the hall to the parents' bedroom. And some tourists have reported the presence of a woman on the tour. Karen Shapiro is a spiritualist who says she can contact spirits in another realm. We asked her to use her abilities to investigate the Hawthorne house and brought along a videotape camera with a special low-light adapter. This seems to be an area I, I feel a presence right here by this window. I feel children energy here. Little kids. Later that evening, Karen visited Susanna Ingersoll's room in the House of the Seven Gables. I 
very sad, a tortured spirit, the feeling of strife from this person, the spirit. Her essence is very strong in this house. And right where I'm standing, I feel like she very well could have sat right here. I feel like um, there were people hiding here. They knew of this place, that this was a safe place, and she, she associated with some, some people. I feel like she associated with some, some people. I feel like she was a, a part of a group of some sort. If the stories of Susanna Ingersoll and the Underground Railroad are true, the attic would have been a perfect hiding place for refugees on their way to freedom. Karen Shapiro is convinced the House of the Seven Gables and the Hawthorne House remain a refuge for something from beyond. It's like a vortex of energy, for lack of better words. That's what it feels like. There are certain areas in this grouping of houses that's here that just draw you, you know, energies that draw you from one place to another. And those energies, yes, can be identified as spirit by all means. But Salem, Massachusetts isn't the only town haunted by the restless spirits of New England's past. The ghost of a murderous innkeeper is said to remain at the scene of his crime. We now return to Haunted History. In the small town of Ashland, Massachusetts, some 70 miles from Salem, stands John Stone's Inn, formerly the Ashland Hotel. Originally built in 1834, it is one of New England's most haunted landmarks. It was built by uh, uh, John Stone, who was a captain in the militia, and um, he knew that there was a railroad being built right next door, so he thought he'd build a, build a hotel. It was called the Railway Inn when he first built it. The inn was built so close to the train tracks that the windows rattled when a train passed by. The coming of the train also brought a new way of life to this small New England town. Outsiders, men and women from the big city, were now coming to Ashland for the first time. These newcomers brought new ideas, brought new beliefs, and yes, did cause people a lot of uneasiness because they were now strangers in these outlying villagers, strangers who might be from the big city. And these new traveling salesmen did much more than inspire a lot of funny stories. Many believe the visit of one such traveling salesman provided the spark for years of ghostly activity within the walls of John Stone's Inn. It was late one night. John Stone, three locals, and a traveling salesman had gathered for a game of poker. And it was two o'clock in the morning, uh, in the wee hours in the morning, and it got hot and heavy. And the salesman uh, got uh, a little rowdy and accused somebody of cheating, and he got up and uh, uh, started, you know, want to know why uh, this is happening, uh, why am I being cheated? And and he started to get a little boisterous, and, and Captain John Stone stood up and uh, went to quiet him down, and they, they scuffled a little bit, and he, he used uh, part of his pistol, just hit him in the head to try to figure to quiet him down, and, and instead uh, uh, the blow was too much, and it, uh, he succumbed to death. Gentlemen, what happened here tonight must never leave this room. John Stone died of natural causes several years after the murder. Many believe his tortured soul is responsible for the hauntings that continue to this very day. Guests and employees of the inn have reported dozens of unexplained occurrences. A female guest recently sat down to dinner, when suddenly she felt a pair of cold hands upon her neck. The woman screamed and ran from the inn, frightened and no doubt still hungry. In the same room, a spirit investigator took this photograph of what appears to be a ghost head entering the room through a closed door. Many believe this may, in fact, be the spirit of John Stone himself.
Another ghost that's been seen in the inn is a young girl, most often found standing in the window of the kitchen dressed in Victorian clothes. Stories are told of a little girl who was reportedly disfigured by broken glass caused by the rattling of a train passing through. The same ghost has been said to skip along the upstairs hallway and fill the walls with eerie childlike laughter. Perhaps the prankish nature of the spirit is responsible for several unexplained occurrences in the kitchen. I had a loaf of bread that, uh, that was up under a warmer and uh, I would take one slice off the loaf each time I put a plate up and I turned around to scramble some eggs and I turned back and the whole loaf of bread was sliced individual perfectly. I mean that was one thing I noticed, the slices were perfect. I mean it was a matter of seconds that I turned around so um, I don't see, it's not possible somebody could have, I mean, the noise factor, I'm able to have heard somebody, it was fairly quiet, it was early in the morning, no one else was around. Tricks have also been played on other members of the staff, tricks that are hard to explain away as natural phenomena. Bartenders uh, used to pull a draught handle down off the, uh, the ale uh, compartment, and it says that after they pull the beer down and put it up, they'd walk to serve it, the handle would come down all by itself again, they'd have to run back and, and close it as fast as they could, and that made them a little nervous because nobody was there to pull it, and there was no one on the front. So uh, it, it wasn't that it was just one, it'd be that one one time, the other one another time, so uh, you couldn't say it was one faulty tap. Uh, the ashtrays would shatter on the table, it had to be a terrific force that had to come down on it. So that happened many times that, uh, from what people have been interviewed for and they had no explanation why that was happening. Despite the sometimes frightening occurrences, or perhaps because of them, people continue to frequent John Stone's Inn and seek out owner Vernon Northover for the latest information. You have two levels of people, one that uh, have read about the uh, John Stone's Inn and I tend to uh, spend time with them and tell them what I know uh, of the history of the place. And then there's the people that have been here for regularly, uh, residents of Ashland. I'll just say, hey Vern, how's the ghost today? You know. <laughs> Ghosts, for some people, like history, are a vital part of our lives. What are ghosts? That's a good question. For many years it was believed that they were the spirits of the dead who return uh, to interact with the living, to complete some task, to uh, seek justice or retribution or even revenge. There's a lot of questions about what their true nature is, and many theories abound. One theory is that they're leftover emotional traces, sort of like a shadow impressed on the fabric of time. Others believe that it might be linked to memories uh, floating in some sort of psychic ether. Some believe that they're so, sort of like a videotape of an activity that's uh, left behind. Others say that they may well be caused by people's own imaginations. That we may, in our own way, project our images onto an environment. Many theories, but few answers. Like the red barns, the rolling hills, and the town halls with their clocks and steeples, hauntings are an equally significant part of the history of New England. We may never know why the spirits return to their ghostly dwellings, but in some form or another, they will apparently remain a part of haunted New England forever. What makes someone notorious? Inconceivable crimes. The hair on the back of your neck stands up when you realize what you're watching. And a passion for publicity. He enjoyed the attention. He wanted to be on the front page. Secret schemes and shocking extremes. Five nights a week. Notorious. Monday through Friday at 8. Only on Bio. True Story.